and gentlemen, welcome for the meeting and uh, a special welcome to our speaker of today, Ms. Fritzful Meyerfeld. And uh, Mr. Meyerfeld uh, has worked in the government, the ministry, and the economic affairs as a trade policy manager and that capacity. Uh, we've negotiated a lot of uh, international organizations within a lot of international organizations and trade agreements uh, on behalf of the Dutch government. And in this sector, uh, as for many of us, we focused on the World Trade Organization, one of the organizations within the uh, network at the World Trade And he will not only tell us something about the history and the work of the WTO, but also focus on what the WTO uh, and international trade can do for Aruba. And um, and so speak, the forwards to hearing of your experiences. I think it was the sure. Thank you so much for this uh, introduction and uh, thank you also for being able to be on such a beautiful island. Uh, it's for me the first time to be on Aruba uh, and I was invited by our friends. Uh, and so we arrived last Friday and tonight we will leave again. But uh, one of the brilliant ideas of my friend was that he uh, that we could give a kind of lecture on international trade, international trade policy. Uh, I worked for nearly 40 years uh, at the Ministry of Economic Affairs in The Hague. Uh, but before that period, I worked two years for the FAO in Panama, uh, so very close to Aruba. Uh, but that was quite a different experience. I worked there at the Ministry of Agriculture and Development and uh, working for the long-term development, uh, development of the agriculture sector in that uh, country. Uh, and from there, I went back to the Netherlands together with Hanneke, and my wife. And uh, I was lucky enough to be directly uh, absorbed by the Ministry of Economic Affairs, working on North-South trade. And I will push this one. Uh, and I was from there on, uh, for, that was in 1980. So that's uh, quite a long time ago, but I started at the Ministry in 1980 and I worked in trade policy for 15 years until 1995. Uh, and that was exactly the time that the WTO was established. In the meantime, I worked at several international organizations. First and foremost at the EU, then the OECD, the uh, club of 24 uh, rich nations in Paris. Uh, and then I started working uh, or at least participating in meetings in the UNCTAD, United Nations Conference of Trade and Development in Geneva, the U UNECE, that's an East-West organization, the Economic Commission for Europe of the United Nations. Uh, also in Geneva, the uh, GATS, the General Agreements on Tariffs and Trade in Geneva, and later on the WTO, the World Trade Organization, also in Geneva. I will refer back later on to this in my introduction. Um, then I will tell a little bit about uh, the whole idea behind international trade. It all started with the great philosopher, the Scottish philosopher, Adam Smith. You might have heard about him. Uh, lots of people have learned that Adam Smith established the basis for open for free trade, for open markets, for liberalization. 
Uh, he was the, the real thinker who started thinking about that and wrote a very, uh, well, a very interesting book that was read by every scientist, uh, more or less, The Wells of Nations. Uh, in already at the time of the uh, American independence, even before the French Revolution. Then uh, Mr. David Ricardo, he was a Jewish uh, trader in London who uh, partly educated in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, he wrote a very interesting book on the principles of uh, political economy and theory. And he really established the basis for international trade policy. Why should we trade with each other? What is the benefit of that to people, to nations? And he basically was at the basis of what we call the comparative cost theory. Uh, and that is the basis for international trade. That theory say, uh, tells us that if you are very good in producing cheese, like people in Holland, uh, then it would be better if you specialize on cheese, uh, while another might be better in supplying some other products or by supplying nice sunny beaches like Aruba, uh, for example. And if you focus on those things that you can produce relatively cheap, but also from good quality, then you could gain the money with that and, uh, someone, uh, and then trade with someone else and both are better off if you deal like that. And if you do that consequently with all kinds of products and all kinds of nations, then you are not only better off, but all those people involved in that are better off and their income will increase more than if you do all the activity you need by yourself. Because that's not very, uh, the last thing is not very effective. So that was the basis for opening markets for free trade versus uh, mercantilism versus protection. And traditionally, nations were inclined, politicians were inclined for protection. For protection. Why? Well, to serve their voters, to serve their, their electorates. And we can understand that. But if they want to uh, serve the interest of the people in their country, then open markets, more free trade, uh, and more uh, pressure to produce effective and competitive, that's much better for the uh, future of the people and for, especially for the growth of income of the people. And that was at least the line of thinking in the Netherlands. I come back on, on the EU. Uh, and also was there a thinking that if we open our markets in the Netherlands or in Europe, uh, and the same in the United States, then we, we give an opportunity for people in other nations, other countries to earn a decent life with supplying their products to our markets. If they earn a decent life in Africa or in Latin America or in Asia, then they feel less the need to vote with their feet. That was more or less the expression. If they are poor and have no opportunity to earn a decent income in their own country, then they have no option then to vote with their feet and uh, uh, walk to, to Europe. And you see that still uh, in nowadays with people from Syria, from Afghanistan and Africa who have no alternative than voting with their feet. But much better is if they have an opportunity to earn a decent life in their own home country. And that's part of the philosophy behind our thinking. Maybe it's good to uh, 
recall some of the history, uh, recent history, because that's also a part of the explanation uh, of our thinking is in, you recall that in 1939, there was the big crash at Wall Street and other buses, and that crash uh, created an enormous unemployment, both in the States, in Europe, but also in other countries as well. Uh, the reaction was a very strong protectionist policy by, by uh, many uh, governments in many countries uh, to uh, close markets so that they hoped that uh, more people could get employed at the local markets. That had some impact, but that has only a short-term positive impact. But on the long term, that has only negative impacts. It, uh, it was contributed uh, together with a number of other uh, reasons to the, uh, to the Second World War. Uh, and especially Germany was very much affected by the enormous inflation created by this crash and the high unemployment. And uh, together with the outcome of the First World War, est established the basis for uh, Mr. Hitler to arise and to come with the Second World War. I'm not, not going too far too specific in all the, the aspects, but uh, that was part of history. But uh, during the Second World War, there were a few visionary people, uh, a Brit an American man, uh, and uh, a Brit, and the Brit was um, Milton Keynes, the uh, famous economist, and they argued we should establish a new international setup, a new international setup with open markets, basically open markets. And they were able to assemble 44 allied nations, uh, the, the allied nations against the Germans, against the Italians, against the Japanese, uh, and uh, bring them together in Bretton Woods in New Hampshire. Uh, and there they was an agreement to establish the IMF, and uh, the, to establish the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And that bank was especially meant to uh, reconstruct Europe, the European economies, but also economies in other parts of the world affected by the impact of the, of the, the Second World War. Well, you know the uh, World Bank that has afterwards developed as the uh, assistant bank for developing on all kinds of other nations. Uh, there was also an attempt to establish a new international trade organization. There was an agreement in 1947 on that one, but that agreement was not accepted by the U.S. Senate. So there was no international uh, trade organization, but there were already a number of agreements on trade, and that agreement was basically the basis of the general agreement on tariffs and trade, the GATT. So there was actually a functional uh, system for also for trade, but unfortunately the organization who should organize this uh, was vetoed by the US Senate. And that's another thing. The US is always very eager to have all kinds of international agreements as long as it doesn't tell uh, the United States what they should do. <laughs> and that, that's something, well, uh, the, uh, some people here know that, but it goes back on the American Constitution and uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who, who uh, constructed uh, the, the Constitution to that effect. But uh, it's very interesting to see this. They always like us to open our markets, but we should tell them what they should do. Okay. Um, there was uh, this catch, and uh, after 1947, 
there were several subsequent uh, trade rounds, trade negotiation rounds, in order to reduce gradually the tariffs of especially the so-called developing uh, developed nations. The nations in Europe, in Asia, some Asian countries, and the United States and Canada. Um, there were seven of these rounds. I, I did not uh, enumerate because that's too specific. But in 90, uh, uh, 1986, they started the uh, last of the Uruguay rounds. And the Uruguay rounds, I uh, will tell a bit about it then uh oh yeah that's uh, over here that was seven years uh, in a row from 1986 to 1993 uh, and that was a, a very encompassing around for the not only um discussing about goods trade goods but also trade in services and some other issues i, I refer back to that we were able to strike a deal at the end of 1993, and in 1994, we established the new WTO. We would, we would have liked that it would be the International Trade Organization, but there was no way for the United States because that name was already uh, too blurred by the Senate. Uh, the problem is there was a World Trade Organization, but there was already a World Tourism Organization. So you now have two WTOs. Uh, okay. The impact of the agreement is large. If you see in 90, the, the agreement on uh, the Get Uruguay Round and the establishment of the WTO, if you see the growth in a number of uh, countries due to the op further opening of markets, especially in Europe and the United States and some other uh, countries like Japan, uh, was fairly strong, uh, in particular in uh, Asian countries, as South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Malaysia Thailand, uh, but subsequently also in in countries like China, India, etc., et uh, and that was that was partly due to the open opening of markets, but also it had to do with the good governance of the uh, the the governor the governments in into these countries. Uh, so, if you compare. The situation of the population of China, India, etc., in let's say the 70s, 80s, and today's, there is a huge development, uh, partly due to uh, opening of markets and also to internal policies. Uh, if you look at today, uh, in the 1990s, there was a focus on global trade liberalization. Uh, to to work together to opening up as much markets as possible for as many countries as possible. Today, the focus is much more on regional trade, uh, trade activity, regional uh, trade liberalization. We already had that, of course, in Europe within the EU. We had the NAFTA agreements in uh, between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, and we have some other agreements, but the focus is much more on strengthening that one. And that has to do partly also with the United States, who wants to marginalize uh, China and, and avoid that China is becoming too big, the, a big player in the international uh, economic scene. <laughs> I'm not going to dwell too much on all the details of the WTO, but after seven years of negotiation within the uh, Uruguay uh, um, round, the, the Uruguay round is called Uruguay round because the negotiations started out in Punta del Este in Uruguay in 1986, 
and it was winded up in Marrakesh in, uh, in Morocco. And it was a, a very interesting uh, time because uh, two weeks in Marrakesh, it's, it's very interesting uh, together with the king of uh, Morocco and uh, very nice horse racing, etc. <laughs> but uh, the, pre, uh, the, the most essential aspects of this uh, triple, uh, trade negotiation was based on the two principles. The principles, most favor nation treatment. If you give a uh, tariff reduction, you don't give it to one country, but you give it to all uh, members of the WTO. So you treat men, treats uh, all countries the same. And national treatment, you treat uh, imports in the same way as you treat your national uh, products. That's the basic notion. So if you have uh, uh, taxes on products, then they apply both on imports as national products. There should not be any difference. Those, those basic principles are still the basis. They were already the basis for the GATT, but are still the basis for the WTO organization. And they're very relevant in how to, how to look at international trade. Then you, we used to have high tariffs in the past. And when I started out, they were already very much reduced on uh, industrial products. But there were two main exceptions, agriculture products, protecting farmers, and uh, trying to maintain a self-sufficiency uh, in agriculture products in Europe that there was a reason for that that had to do with the Second World War, etc. Uh, and there was a, a, a second area, and it was uh, textiles and clothing that was also uh, traditionally very protected. But uh, especially textile product and and and, and uh, clothes are easily pro produced in developing countries. So we pressed very much. That, uh, that those tariffs and import barriers uh, would go down. And at the end, we succeeded. But that was a big fight, especially within the EU. And uh, non-trade barriers, you, you can... Uh, Non-trade barriers are all kind of tricks and tropes uh, to, to uh, try to avoid imports. Uh, you can uh, quantitative restrictions, but you can all kind of uh, also think of all kind of quality uh, aspects that you apply to, to imports and trying to reduce those imports. Uh, one, one nice example of this is uh, our friend from Japan. They refuse to import or they refuse to uh, have imports of skis, uh, skis for uh, skiing on snow. And the reason for this was that snow in Japan was different from snow elsewhere. But that's a very convincing argument. Uh, but that was the kinds of reason that some uh, nations applied. Well, the are a number of other uh, things I don't dwell too much, but for example, subsidies is also uh, have for people uh, for countries that have uh, some money a nice nice uh, instrument to give uh, support to their own uh, producers and to uh, capture markets abroad. Uh, like uh, the Chinese, they have a lot of uh, money. They earn a lot of money and can use that to uh, get uh, an, an, uh, or to earn access to other markets. Then uh, a very new part of the negotiation in the European round was trade and services. Was that well? You have especially to facilitate international trade in goods. You have banks, you have insurance companies, you have accountancy companies, and you have fairly many uh, different service sectors. Uh, but if they are restricted 
in access to foreign companies, then that creates a problem. Uh, and uh, even within the EU, we still had uh, very limited access to a number of services sectors in other countries, but we were able to strike a deal there and to get more uh, transparency in trade services and, and more liberalization in that respect. And the same was uh, on investment measures, also very important for trades, because uh, if you are imposing all kinds of restrictions to foreign in investments, then that is not very uh, stimulating, obviously, for new investment in your country. Uh, and some, some nations are very creative in imposing all kinds of restrictions. So there, are now, there is now a kind of regime for that. The same for intellectual property rights. That has to do, for example, with uh, patents, uh, patent for medicines, for example. Uh, uh, if you are, uh, have too long uh, a uh, uh, right to protect your own medicine, uh, then you can earn a lot of money, but that's not very good for the competition, and let alone for the development of new uh, medicines. And so uh, there are a lot of different intellectual property rights, and we were able to strike a deal in that area. And that was uh, also uh, quite an achievement, because there, at, at that point, especially uh, countries like India were heavily opposed to have any, any international agreement on that one, because they, they were fearing for their own markets. <coughs> Let me see. Um, I, I go back. Yeah, um, I go back to this one. Um, I, I was uh, negotiating with the EU because I was responsible from the Netherlands for the external trade policy of the EU, not for the internal things. There were other people involved for that. The idea behind the EU is quite clear, open markets and reduce any trade restriction between the member states of the EU. When I started out, there were 12 member states. In 1980, there were 12 member states. Uh, and that was grown to 28 member states. And nowadays, without the UK, we have 27 member states. And I can uh, tell you, that is quite, uh, quite a different a uh, difficult thing to convince all those member states that they have to accept all kind of competition, all kind of uh, uh, competition for other member states in the EU, from all those 27 member states, in particular in areas like agriculture. But we were able to do that, and you see the impact of it, and the economic development of not only uh, the countries like the Netherlands and Germany, huh? the recovery of Germany after the Second World War. The idea of the EU is to bring together the former enemies, Germany and France, in one big economic union. And that was a very brilliant idea. And, and it worked out huh? by open markets within those countries that, uh, uh, that worked out. But if we do that in, within the EU, why should we do that to other nations in the world? That was uh, a little bit our thinking. We did, uh, uh, we did a lot of that thinking also in the OECD, at least trying to prepare our debates in the other uh, international fora, in particular for the GATT and the WTO. Uh, well, and I worked for 50 years within those fora. I had to travel quite quite a lot, but okay, I I was not not uh, uh, not I had no problem with that, but partly due to my wife who was taking care for the home. Uh, uh, okay, but uh, we had to do all these negotiations uh, within the different fora, and that was well very interesting to do. Um, 
then I continue. Uh, what what does this mean for a, a relatively small country, a small player in the international scene, uh, as uh, Aruba? Holland is a small country but it has a large economy, a relatively for a small country, a large economy. Uh, but uh, Aruba has a, a small economy. And then is the question, what should we as uh, Aruba should do? What, what kind of uh, a, a policy? And I'm not a policy advice for Aruba, so I'm not going to tell you. But what you see is that there is already uh, a lot, a lot of imports. Uh, of course, there are small companies here in, in uh, Aruba, but mainly Aruba was already specializing. First of all, on the production of coal, but after the the amount of coal was uh, was thrown down, and there was more competition from uh, other uh, coal nations like South Africa that went down the, the drain. And then there was, a, for a time, the phosphate production at Cerro Colorado. Uh, then the refined oil came up, or there were two uh, uh, refineries. Um, uh, special, the Lago oil refinery was uh, the largest refinery in the world for a long period. And it was very important during the Second World War to supply kerosene to the Allied uh, armies. Uh, uh, but afterwards, when the Arabs came up, etc., it was very difficult for the Lago refinery to compete at a global level. So that uh, came, went down the drain as well. And now we are on tourism. And of course, uh, that is something that you have, again, a lot of international competition. So uh, that is also something that uh, requires... Uh, further thinking on how to make, maintain a competitive position in that uh, respect. So, and that's my last sheet. Uh, what you nowadays see, uh, we have, we had of, of course, the last uh, few years, the COVID uh, pandemic in the world. And that had also an impact on economic uh, development and, uh, and trade flows. But you see also a very strong recovery last year and, and today on, in the international trade. You see the economic growth that's uh, at least the, uh, what we expect uh, and also uh, the IMF is that it will continue to grow, uh, especially also uh, due to the uh, upturn of uh, this situation, the economic situation in China. Uh, but on, in, the, in the meantime, you see that also uh, transport costs will have an impact on international flows. Um, tourism, by the grow, growing income of people in more and more countries, will grow even uh, stronger. So tourism is one of the biggest sources of economic activity for the future. And uh, Aruba might uh, take a nice part of that. Uh, but what is needed to, uh, uh, to maintain a competitive edge, then it, you meet the need to uh, invest in uh, those elements, uh, education, knowledge, science, innovation, and opening to changing conditions because the world will change every day and we should be flexible to see those uh, new trends and see what a nation like Aruba could do to, uh, to cope with those changing conditions. And I think that is, well, a message that will be relevant also for the future of Aruba. Uh, that's my introduction and uh thank you and i hope you will have questions but i'm not sure if i can give an adequate answer to those questions thank you